Hi everyone, um, I'm the co-founder and CEO of Squawker, we're a startup who were approaching two years uh, for being live, so much, much smaller business than probably anybody else in this room, uh, and a much, much earlier stage in the genesis of our business. Um, this is going to be a bit different, because we're going to talk about football, primarily. Anyone like football? Hands up, you like football? Yay, let's talk about football. Um, but we'll also talk about technology and digital. And what I'm going to do is give you an idea of how we launched a business into a very, very congested and competitive marketplace um, as a tiny, tiny business and got traction through innovation. Um, very quickly, a little bit about me, just so you know who I am and where I'm coming from. Um, these are some pictures of me and stuff that happened to me over the last couple of years. Um, I work a lot. I've got a nine-month-old son, spending a lot of time with him. Try starting a business, having a little kid, it's brilliant. Um, this is our team, We've got an awesome team, um, uh, based over in Bank. And I do a lot of public speaking. Um, I am actually, even though we're talking about football, from the performance, ma performance marketing industry. So um, I started at IPC and then went to Trade Doubler. Um, so I was at Trade Doubler for four years, um, and I basically had to rebuild the publisher side of the business there. Uh, and that was probably my first um, introduction to innovation in digital, um, especially at a company like Trade Doubler. Um, at the time, we had to overcome many challenges to try and win back publisher trust, um, launch new products. Innovation wasn't that quick at that business, for those of you that worked with them. Um, so it, it was a tough battle. Um, however, we learned a lot by doing that. Um, those are my media jobs. I've also worked in Blockbuster. I have done telesales. I sold accidental death insurance to Barclay Card customers till 9 o'clock at night on a weeknight. Um, I've sold hardware and software to the NHS. That was fun. Um, I didn't work at MTV, but I worked in music videos. My degree is actually in film. Obvious that I should be standing here. Um, I used to stack shelves in Londis. Did that when I was nine. Um, I used to drive a van of paint around London. That was very, very fun. Um, and I used to work at uh, Twickenham Rugby Ground, uh, pitch lining, and everyone who went to uh, see England play at Twickenham between the years of 2001 and 2003, I'd probably look for your bag. Yeah. Um, I wanted to just show you that because I, one of the most important things to me uh, when I think about where our business is and how we think about strategy in our business and creating innovation in, in a startup, in a competitive marketplace, it is very important to leverage across many, many skill sets. So I'm going to go back one, sorry. What you see here across all these businesses, I learned very, very different things across all these. Every single one of these has an impact into the decision making now um, at Squawker. Just thought I'd show you that. So I'm going to talk to you about process led innovation. I don't want that term to draw away the romanticism of the word innovation. I don't want it to um, um, make you think this is going to be boring or um, by the numbers. Um, because actually, this is a very, very useful exercise. Um, and it's an exercise that we've had to go through uh, to try and understand where we should be positioned in the marketplace. Um, a little bit about Squawker first. Some of you may have heard of us. Some of you might not have heard of us. Um, what we are is a football companion. Um, what we do is we leverage data in very, very new ways. We take data live from games, and we process it, we visualize it, and we give it to fans for free. We do this across mobile and across web. I'll, sh I'll show you how that works. Um, outside of game time, uh, we're delivering news, social media, views, images, um, videos, GIFs, Pinterest, Vine, the whole media spectrum where we've been testing over the last year and a half or so to figure out what's turning football fans on. And I'll show you why we've been doing this across such a broad spectrum. Um, right now, we're outperforming. I'm happy to say that we're outperforming um, pretty much every football app out there in the UK market, which is great, considering we haven't spent any money to do it. Um, and we've had a bit of industry recognition, so we were named uh, 30th in T3 magazine's list of uh, 66 British businesses changing the world. Just a little bit about how Squawker actually works. We started Squawker as a second screen. Everyone familiar with the term second screen? So what we were trying to do is really understand that 90-minute period. How can we create an incredible product for football fans for free in that 90 minutes? How can we augment their experience through whole new ways? So that's what we started in doing. Uh, June the 12th, 2012 is when we actually launched. Um, we do it across mobile now, across tablet and web. Tablet's not native. Native is coming. I've got Android launching soon for you, for you Android fans. Simon, I know. We're only launching it for you, frankly. Yeah because you keep badgering me. Um, we take um, data feeds from a company called Opta. Some of you may have heard of them. Um, we take all their data feeds and we visualize them in real time. When I say real time, um, we will show you a goal where, where the ball went in the net in about 25, 30 seconds after it actually happens. 
Again, this is all for free. We're not showing you video. We're giving you more data and more information about the game. We also pull a feed from Reuters, which is really interesting. So all of their photographers are on the ground. We're pulling an API from their system. Every probably two minutes, three minutes when it's a break and play, these guys are pressing an upload button on their photos that they've taken. All goes into a big database. We, uh, we built a, a bit of technology to pull that and scan it and say, great, OK, tagging it, saying, hey, this picture's from Swansea, Liverpool. That's going into our 90-minute experience for whoever's watching that game. OK, so it's, it's pretty cool stuff. We built our own tagging solution below this as well. We're covering a load of different leagues um, around the world, um, all in real time, near real time, 25 to 30, 30 seconds behind. Um, and again, all of this is, is free for fans. It's just in English at the moment, but we do have a, a global audience, and we are addressing that. So has anybody worked in the football industry? <coughs> no? I could say what the hell I like, really, though, couldn't I? Not you two. <laughs> Nathan over there. Um, I'm not going to. What I really want to talk to you about is, is how hard it is to innovate in this specific market. And hopefully this will spark off uh, a few ideas for how you're innovating in your own businesses, in your own markets, because um, I think it's very, very interesting. Uh, the reason I chose this picture, I found this picture and I thought it was really cool. I really like Star Wars. I'm a geek. Um, and I saw this really, really old time picture. And this, this kind of sums up where I, I think digital technology, innovation and football is. It's something really cool, you know, it's something really cool, but it's really, really old now as well. And it sounds really strange. For those of you that haven't worked in the football industry, this may sound really counterintuitive. You think of all the money going through football. You think about all the investment from people like Sky and BT and, and all the wonderful platforms that people launch. Surely there must be so much in innovation there. Actually, weighted, considering how much money there actually is in that industry and how much media power actually holds, there's very, very little innovation. And, and I'm going to talk to you about why. So, believe it or not, fans in football, and I haven't seen this in any other sport, and specifically in this country, fans are very resistant to change. You've got your typical football fan in the UK, old school, goes to the games, reads the sun or the mirror, not the sun if you're a Liverpool fan, like me. Um, and they, they, they have a certain way of thinking about the game. They don't want their game to be changed. You, you probably heard um, a lot of backlash in the papers um, over player wages, um, about technology coming into sport. Is that ruining the game? Um, very, very. Um, I'm not saying those views are wrong. I'm just saying they're, they're, they're long, long standing and long held. Um, and then you've got companies like Twitter coming along with wonderful um, consumer experiences um, in real time um, and bringing something else to the sport, bringing something else to the, the enjoyment. And we've certainly seen um, a lot of um, backlash from fans who are at games and they're on their phone, they're taking pictures or uh, they're, they're videoing around the stadium or they're sending a tweet because something's happened or, or posting something to Facebook other old, older season ticket holders perhaps turning around saying, what are you doing? Why aren't you watching the game? It's not that they're not enjoying the game. They're augmenting their experience. And if we ask ourselves in 10 years' time, are more people going to be doing that or less? It's going to be more. So uh, actually, one funny story here. Um, there was an article that came out in uh, The Guardian uh, probably about three and a half, four weeks ago. Um, and the article was titled, um, Why Statistics Miss the Point of Football? So it was written by um, someone who claims he is against modern football, like traditional football, doesn't like all the statistics and analysis that goes into it, just wants to see football and, and, and see how it's played. And he actually referenced in this article on The Guardian, Squawker. He said, businesses like Squawker are, are, are ruining football for everyone. You know, they're taking away the drama, they're, they're taking away the passion that we, we all feel, they're reducing football to numbers. Obviously, I wrote a response in The, in the Guardian, um, which I thought was very, very fair. Um, and my point was, actually, why would you not want to know more about the thing that you love? For free. Why would you not want to know that? Especially if the information is digestible. Especially if it's, if it's something that you can look at and understand. It's not a spreadsheet full of data. It's a visualization. So all of you using um, the Kenshi platforms, looking at, looking at your analytics and looking at the visualized graphs, etc. It's visualization. It's exactly the same. What we're doing is offering it to football fans. Um, but it's normal fans, not people that understand data. Um, and I wrote a big response saying, hey, this is great. This is, this is innovation in football. We're helping. You don't have to look at the scorecard site. You don't have to look at statistics um, for your team to understand how well they're playing if you do not choose. However, more and more people are choosing to do that because more and more people want to be educated about the thing that they love. Um, that, uh, that article spawned off um, a series of four blog posts by somebody in Cardiff who wrote um, uh, many, many blogs about how much he hated me personally and about how much I was, I personally was ruining football, um, which is just, I'm honored, really. I hope there's somebody to choose to write about me. Um, and 
it's not just the fans. It's the industry itself, especially in this country. Has anyone read this book, Why England Lose? Okay, everybody that put their hands up and said they're football fans and haven't put their hands up now need to go out and buy this book. Maybe Ken Shi would like to buy all, all their employees who like football um, uh, this book. It's very, very cheap. You can get good bulk deals on Amazon. I don't get any commission. Um, maybe I should get an iTunes link, affiliate link. Okay. Um, it's, it's a great book. Uh, and it's done by two guys, Simon Cooper, not that Simon Cooper, a different Simon Cooper, and Simon Szymanski. They're both economists. So they're, and they're both big, big football fans and journalists. So what they wanted to do was get under the skin of football and really try and understand it from an economic point of view. And there's loads of really, really cool um, pieces in this book um, covering many, many topics in football, transfer fees and how much you should be paying for players and all this kind of stuff. Um, however, one of the really interesting points that it pulled out was around the class system in this country. And this is really, really interesting to me personally because um, the question was uh, brought up in the book why are there no players in the Premier League, this country's top league for football, of Indian descent? Many, many players go to any Sunday league, <laughs> Sunday league part around London, Leicester, Birmingham, Manchester. You will see lots of um, um, young men of Indian descent playing football and absolutely loving football. Are they bad players? No, there's some very, very good players there. So this is really strange. Why haven't they broken through? Um, so they did a bit of an investigation. They looked at the amount of players there were, and the, the numbers just didn't stack up. They said, it's all these players making it through to a certain stage of the youth academy that are from Indian descent, but they're not making it through. It's really strange. The numbers just don't add up. How can not one of these players have, have broken through? This is an anomaly. Not quite a black swan, which is a term that is often misused at the moment. Um, it's an anomaly. So they started to investigate it. They interviewed lots of players. And what they came to was there's a class division uh, within football. and those of you in this room, probably more intelligent football fans, will probably be able to relate to this now that I'm talking about it. Because what happens here is um, uh, young men from Indian descent, um, more often than not, I'm making a bit of a generalization here, but more often than not, have come from um, a more of an academic and educational background. And when they get to a certain level, they're playing with um, other players who aren't from the same background socio socioeconomically. And what's happening is they're ostracized. So they turn their back at an early age. And there's an example in the book from, um, not from an Indian player, from an England international. They don't name who he is. I've got a pretty good idea of who he is. Who, in an interview, um, totally nondescript, said to them, I used to go to training for my Premier League team, and they were in the Champions League at the time. This wasn't a very long time ago. And I had the Daily Mail under my arm, and everybody laughed at me. That's how much of a class division there actually is in L England's top division. So... That's a division that's in football. That is um, the resistance to change within this sport itself. And that's a, a, a pretty heavy one for everyone to take. And the other division is obviously in technology. So top right, Does anyone, can anyone tell me what that image is from? Exactly. So this was um, at the World Cup, Frank Lampard for England. This would have been a very important goal because it's got us back in the game. Um, had a shot, great shot, 25 yards out maybe. Totally crossed the line. Images show that that ball crossed the line. That goal was not given. England proceeded to go out to the World Cup. Probably deserved to go out to the World Cup because it's not a great team at the moment. However, isn't that weird that that hasn't been rectified? Only now, this season, after all of these seasons, the technology to do this has been available for 15 years. Only now has it been passed that goal line technology has been introduced into football. And that is from a resistance to change within the sport itself. Rugby can do it. Rugby can put no try. Players take a break for a couple of minutes. Big uh, case. Any Arsenal fans here? What happened with uh, Alex Oxlade Chamberlain the other week? Why don't you tell everyone? Does it hurt too much? The pain is too raw. So um, Alex Oxlade Chamberlain um, handled the ball um, in the penalty area. The referee sent off a different player, Kieran Gibbs. Sent him off. And even when. Even when play was stopped and Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain came up to referee and he said, ref, ref, it was me, nothing happened. <laughs> nothing happened. The player went off. It was obviously rescinded afterwards. However, in this game of multi, multi-million pound uh, matches, they couldn't stop for like 30 seconds to check? Is that not weird? Is that not really, really, really weird? But it just shows to indicate the, 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 the state of that market right now. Commercially, for someone like us, we're a publisher, we're ad-funded. This is kind of how it is when you go to a rights holder, UEFA or a FIFA, and you know, try and get a decision out of them. So imagine this is uh, Sepp Blatter or, or, or someone like that. I'll give you a second to read this.
So, the chalky substance, that's who you're pitching for budget, more often than not. Or pitching for a decision on how to work with them uh, as a rights holder. So that's tough as well. And then you've got competition. <laughs> Look at this for a competitor list. Not bad, eh? Imagine waking up in the morning and then looking yourself in the mirror going, right, who are we competing against today? Yeah, that's a big list of people. So, one of the things that I always reference at this point is uh, a term called catnaccio. Anyone, any Italians here? Fam familiar with the term? Could you explain how influential it has been on Italian football? Very much so. Very much, <laughs> very much defending. Um, uh, it literally means door bolt. Um, and it's, it's a way of just stopping the opposition coming through and, and setting out your team so you're not going to get beat. It did, it, did win, it did win four World Cups and then proceeded to get destroyed by uh, total football uh, in Holland, I'm afraid. Um, anyway, sorry. Big on football history. Um, so, challenges. Um, we're talking about innovation. We're talking about how we've launched a business in, into this very, very hyper-aggressive marketplace, which is resisting change. We have even a consumer base that sometimes will not accept change. When it's hard to get budget, and actually, you look at the, the incumbents that are there already who are not innovating, you've got the incumbents there that will shut any doors, door bolt, for example, start in your face uh, if you try and play. Who in their right mind would start a business in this market? <laughs> Dumbo over here. So, how do you innovate in this kind of market? How do you do it? Um, step one, and this, this is our thinking. I'm going to show you our thinking as, as we've built this business and the results from this thinking. Um, step one, we had an idea. We had an idea about the second screen. We had an idea about visualizing data in real time for fans alongside social media and images. Maybe it will work. We don't know. We, we have to try it. Um, however, it's a big risk. You know, we spent our own money to start this business. We were self-funded to begin with. Um, the job was to validate. Validate as quickly as possible. And validate uh, as, uh, as across many, many markets, as many markets as we could. The biggest, biggest decision we made in the genesis of our business as a second screen was, hey, we're not going to launch onto mobile first. We're going to be that really weird second screen company that launched onto web first. Why did we do that? Well, this, this, this slide will probably tell you. It's much, much quicker to get learnings, much, much quicker to um, be agile with your development, uh, release new products, take down other products, and, and iterate on a daily basis if you really wanted to via web than mobile. This may sound really, really obvious, but when you're sitting there with your own cash and you're, and you're starting a business and you left a well-paid job, these are the kind of things that go through your head. How are we going to prove that this innovative idea that we've got is going to work? So we launched onto web first, which is, um, yeah, everybody kind of looked at us like we were crazy uh, when we did it. But it helped us. It helped us so much to try and figure out what we should be doing. What are fans liking? What aren't they liking? What are people from who are coming to the site from Nigeria at 3 o'clock in the morning? What are they liking? How long are they spending on the site? What pages are they looking at? This is what the site looked like when we first launched it. And uh, it was web and this, this particular uh, part uh, uh, rendered onto a uh, tablet. Um, so one side of the screen, we'd be showing you social media. The other side, we're processing real-time data. So we launched for the European Championships, which is what this game was. And to give you an idea about how we thought about innov in innovation in terms of the user experience, here is what we call our game line filter. What we were trying to think about was, if you come home late from work, which probably many of you do, um, you turn on the TV and you look at the football, you don't need to or the internet to tell you what the score is. It's right there. But what can we tell you that you don't know? How can we tell you the story of the game as quickly as possible, not through a spreadsheet of Excel data? How can we tell it, for you, tell it to you through visualization? What you have here in real time, um, with 30, uh, 25 to 90 seconds, this will update with possession. Who's got the ball over five minute chunks? You can drag these two red lollipops and you can start analyzing data across uh, those periods. Um, so for example, if you're winning 3-0 and you come into the game at 60 minutes, great, you know that your team is winning 3-0. What else do you know? You might have had 10% of the ball <laughs> all up until that point. That tells you a story. That helps you understand more about the game. But what I wanted to show you here in terms of validation was monetization. So, to, come, uh, to, to, to cut a, short, uh, a long story short, we were really, really keen to try and deliver a brand new type of advertising, a, a type of advertising that we built um, proprietary, a type of advertising that we thought would 
not only help the display market, but would help the performance market in a way as well. What you have here is uh, ads we were running for dominoes throughout the game. Now, if you'd come into this game in this match center, as we call it, before 15 minutes, you would have had a different message here. What we did was 15 minutes into the game, dynamically changing all the messaging to say, hey, here's your halftime voucher code. For those of you that aren't football fans, a half of football lasts 45 minutes. So our bet was, hey, after 15 minutes, can we get people to order a pizza? Can we do that? Can, can we do this real-time marketing thing that, that, that people have been half mentioning at the time? Um, just to focus in on, the, on these ads. These had a 2.5% click-through rate on, these are standard display. There's, there's, there's nothing else, it's, not, it's no other type of ad unit. It is standard display, had 2.5% click-through rate. Those of you that have worked in display will know what the average click-through rate is in display, so it's probably like 10 times less than that. Um, so we know that worked. And there's a few ways I know this, I know this worked. Um, through the reporting, obviously. Um, we know that there was 15% click to order. Uh, we know there was 40% uh, returning customers in the following month. But most importantly, um, the person that ran the campaign at uh, Arena Media Havas, Stacey, now works for us. Um, so unless she's just committing career suicide, she must have seen something in that as well. This is an example of uh, how some of these ads uh, worked. And again, these were not big budgets. This was our test. This was to try and figure out, have we got something yet? Have we got a business? If we didn't, fine, no worries. Like, can it try something else? We would have had enough startup cash to do that. But it's about valida validating our innovative idea. We're at a point now, after, well, after a year and a half, of validation where we've been iterating, iterating, iterating all the time on the web, where we're managing to drive average dwell times of 39 minutes during live Premier League games. This is from the UK, from UK traffic. That's pretty cool, right? That's a long time to be able to talk to, talk to football fans from a brand's point of view with an innov innovative uh, method. So that was step one. All of that was step one, right? And that took a long time, that step. So this is not necessarily chronological. Know thyself and know thy enemy. You've got to know what you can do. You've got to know what your com uh, com competitor competitors are doing as well. So as I said, we started as this 90-minute business as a second screen to try and figure out, OK, what can we deliver in that second screen experience? How can we be amazing for both fans and, as I've shown you, for brands as well? How can we deliver incredible advertising? However, to know thyself and know thy enemy, you've got to know the market. You've got to look at your analytics. And we start to figure out that, hang on a minute, how can we be a 90-minute business when football is a 24-7 business? This doesn't sit right. So we iterated. We expanded. We now have a gossip column that goes out between 7 and 8 on mobile and on web and on tablet. We see a traffic peak now between 7 and 8, which is very cool. It's organic. We're not buying in traffic for this yet. Um, and we're, we're doing many, many different types of content. Editorial is huge for us. And um, is in the slides earlier on, um, looking at um, when mobile peaks and then when tablet, when uh, desktop peaks and then tablet. Ours is exactly the same. Um, and we've optimized our content for that. It's not to say they're different users, different football fans. Probably the, a lot of time they're the same football fans on, the sa on different devices. Um, we do lots of news. We launch about um, 40 to 50 editorial pieces a day. Um, to hit this lunchtime market when you're looking for transfer news, looking to, for match reports for the games. Um, and then in the evening, that's when second screening really kicks off, when we have our very, very high engagement times. In terms of user value, absolutely over here. That's where the brands want you to hit. In terms of volume, here and here are very, very important. However, it's about building a campaign across all of those for brands, um, which isn't something all media owners have the ability to do. Um, so that's one of the ways that we're working. A similar story at weekends. So this is during the weekdays at weekends, slightly different, but also I'll show you what that end part is. When people are out in the evenings in the pubs, you will see a spike in squawk and mobile traffic as people start comparing their players and, and arguing in the pub about which player was best. So the way that we did this was uh, we launched this live feed. This, uh, this is screenshots from our iOS app. It's free. Please download it. Um, uh, with a live feed and fixtures. The way that we were, were, were pulling all this in is not by accident. It's by absolute design of understanding what our current fans were looking for and what our competitors didn't have. So this is that process-led um, innovation. It's not always this case of, Eureka, I understand what we had to do. It's not always like that. In fact, a vast majority of the time, it's not like that. The innovation will come through process. The innovation will come through understanding your business and your competitor's business. Um, I won't go through, through, through all of these slides because I know I'm running out of time. Um, however, the way that we started to release products across mobile uh, and across the web suddenly started to cater for all these different types of fans. This fan in the evening, this fan during the daytime, the fan in the morning. 
Um, all of our products started to, to, to fall into those categories. Um, and we did this across web and across mobile, and we tried to port uh, as many learnings across. Some of them are different. Some of the stuff that works on web doesn't work on mobile. Um, however, things like as it stands, tables, the editorial pieces, it works, it works across, um, across all fans. And again, this, wa this wasn't the product that we initially had. This wasn't the in initial innovation uh, that we came up with. But through process, it became the innovation. Through process, it became part of the business. Um, and iteration, massively, massively important. Um, so even though we had all these great, uh, great tools for football fans, it wasn't enough. Three weeks ago, we released something called a comparison matrix. Um, this is a really cool piece of kit. It's just on the web at the moment. Um, but what you can do is you can pull um, any six players or teams, or you can choose uh, Wayne Rooney in the Champions League versus Wayne Rooney in the Premier League. You can choose 55 different options down left-hand side. You press a button, go. All of this visualizes instantly with a star to show you who's the best in that category. It's really about giving football fans the, the ammunition they need and the innovation that they need to be able to win their arguments. That's absolutely what it is. The average dwell time across this page is 22 minutes. There's not that many web pages that publishers have that have a dwell time like that. We don't even monetize that page. Stace, we should totally monetize that page. I've just thought about that. Uh, in, in terms of uh, innovating and iterating the monetization, um, we looked at what everyone was doing in the betting market. It's quite a, quite a big market for us. Um, and we started to work with people at like Betfair and looking at their API in new ways and, and trying to understand how we could feed that in in, in very exciting uh, methodologies. And what we did was on, on the Squawk of um, Football app, the iOS app, you can choose which teams you like and, and which players you like. We're pulling all that data, then we're matching that up and saying, oh, actually, so for example, I like Liverpool, my main team. I like Napoli, Atletico Madrid, Montreal Impact, who doesn't? Um, and I will get automated notifications and odds on those teams and those players at different times, sometimes in game, in the match, in the match center, sometimes out of game. If I go on at three, um, three o'clock in the morning, I will still be hit with something that's relevant to me and is updated. It's a little timestamp here telling you at what point that odd is, um, is valid for. So last one, maximizing your resources and staying fresh. So when we launched our app, we wanted to make a big, big song and dance about it. No, we did not buy bus advertising. Of course we didn't. No, we did not jump into a um, TFL office, hijack a sign, and put our own uh, notif notifications up there. However, we mocked this stuff up. Went absolutely viral. 400 retweets off of this in 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Not all of it, were, not all the replies were nice replies. Some people saying, what the hell is this? How, wh why have they gone into a tube session? That's great. That's the kind of buzz I want for my business. Um, so you've got to think differently. We had to come up with whole new ways to try and get this out there. This is some of the, our in infographic work that we produce. This is when um, uh, Wayne Rooney signed his new contract. So this is uh, in um, 20 pound notes, how high his wages would be alongside <laughs> some uh, rather famous landmarks. And again, this is just us taking content and trying to innovate in a new way and, and iterating our content constantly. It's actually the second version of this kind of graph we did. We did one with Gareth Bale, and we knew it worked really, really well. So we started to tweak little things and try and understand, okay, what got people going on that one? Let's iterate for the next one. That process-led innovation, absolutely. So I'm nearly there, don't worry. Um, just the results of this. Um, process-led innovation and where it's led us to today. As I said, we've been going for less than two years. Um, now, we're averaging about uh, 100,000 uniques a day. Less than 0.5% of that is paid. It's organic. So you can look at that in two, one or two ways. You can look at that and say, hey, all right, you built an okay organic business. You can look in the other way and go, hey, you should totally be using Kenshu. You can get that way higher. Um, open to discussion. Um, in terms of us understanding our own business and understanding our brand worth, and, 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 and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, I remember you saying earlier on that you were trying to build a brand, and yeah, man, it's bloody hard. Uh, <laughs> that's what we're trying to do as well. Um, we're, we're measuring how many people are seeing our brand name um, globally, um, anywhere, through social, on our own site, on, on mobile, on tablet. Um, our brand's reaching over 200 million football fans a month. Zero paid in social. We don't pay in social. Right now, again, there's a discussion to be had there. But that's totally organic. That's through innovating and iterating with our content. Figuring out what works at 2 in the morning on Facebook. What works at 3 o'clock in the morning on Twitter for Australian fans. What is it? We measure everything here. And this is, again, I have to say again, process-led innovation. 
We're now, we've now we're now followed by footballers, clubs, uh, brands, celebrities. You get people like Piers Morgan tweeting this out. Is he still a celebrity or is he gone now? Uh, I don't know. Um, but as I said before, I'm a Liverpool fan. Um, we beat Spurs at the weekend. Sorry, sorry to Spurs fans. What happened after that game? About an hour and a half of the end of the match, our goalkeeper, Simon Mingale, tweeted out the league table. He tweeted out from Squawker. We've never spoken to Simon Mingale. We've never spoken to any of the players at Liverpool Football Club, even though I'd love to. Um, but our brand got to a, has got to a point where these kind of professional Premier League players, he'll go to the World Cup as well, whether he's number one or not, I don't know, um, know our brand. That's pretty cool, right? It's taken a lot of hard work, but that's only through innovation of content we've managed to get there. Um, the app that we've launched averages over 10 screens viewed per session. That's good for those of you uh, in the mobile world. Uh, we know that we built a product that is, is solid, that fans are enjoying. There's a lot of engagement there. Um, we're releasing products every two weeks. That's tough. Like We're really on the development team all the time. They don't like us very much anymore. Um, however, we have to because we're taking all these learnings that are coming through, the iteration, the innovation, understanding it, digesting it, spouting it back out again. We're not right every time. We've taken down products. Bring it back. Go back to your drawing board. How can we make this work? If it doesn't work, get rid of it. Will it work? How will it work? Get it back out there. I appreciate that not everybody can do two weeks. Um, and we're now, as a result of all the process-led innovation uh, we've been building, we're about to release a, a, a new type of fantasy game. Uh, for those of you who like fantasy football, uh, which will be available for the World Cup. Um, can't tell you too much more about that. Um, so I've hit exactly 30 minutes. That's for you, boy. Um, there you go. That's, that's me. Um, any questions? Just talk about football if you want. I think that's probably every single day our, st our story, <laughs> frankly. Um, bearing in mind, as I said, we, we started as a, as, a, as a second screen business and we evolved from there. We still are, but it's a case of uh, understanding that and taking that out. The motto that you're talking about is very much more in the investment world. Um, and uh, I'm afraid to say it's, it's very different here in Europe than, than in the States. In the States, yeah, absolutely, fail. It, it almost puts you on a higher pedestal because investors believe that you're at that level now where you know, you, you will know more. Uh, in Europe, we, we haven't seen the case. We haven't, been, we haven't taken any venture capital money yet. Um, however, I think that we would have to bring all of our iterative knowledge to those discussions when we, when we do it. But hey, it's part of life, right? Very good. Oh, oh. questions? Well, it's very, very rare that we have champagne in the office. This was for our app launch. And so I opened this one. The first thing it did was bounce off the ceiling and hit our product director on the head. Um, the cork, sorry. Um, but yeah, Craig, you're, ab you're absolutely right. It's never, it never stops. One of the things about having a consumer-facing business is you're just getting feedback all the time. Literally, we, we <laughs> you can have like a thousand tweets a day directed to our account, people asking us stuff. Or um, We had an email um, two weeks ago from a guy saying, um, hi, really love Squawker, it's great. Um, please can you tell me when Android's coming out because I need to make a decision on my next phone purchase. <laughs> this is a real email. I actually got this. Um, and that's great. Imagine the, the pressure of responsibility as well that you, you, you get from that with 100,000 unique fans uh, in a day all looking at the site. Um, Champagne's great. If you've got any, we'll drink it. But uh, more often than not, we'll be down the pub having a couple of pints, and <laughs> that's it. We're v it's very much 24 hours, though. I mean, there's guys in the office all the time. Shift works, great. Sorry, next gentleman next to you has got a question. Why do you have your own fantasy football team which from, like, um, you know, when you know you already have something fantasy football team, like, that's 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 it's a very interesting question. What I haven't told you about is the work we do in data. Um, so in a, any given football match, there'll be about 3,000, 4,000 data points from the actual game. So opt to collect these. The Sky's got these. BT's got these. Lots of other people have this raw data. We take that data and lay an algorithm on top of it to try and understand how well players are playing. It's called our performance score. From that 3,000, 4,000 data points, we're now extrapolating over 500 million in 90 minutes. So we have our own weighting to understand how well or how badly players are playing. 
It's very accurate. It's more accurate than anything else we've seen on the market. It's still free to use. However, using that as a methodology to help build games makes much more sense than, oh, okay, choose your 11 players. You'll get a point for scoring a goal. You'll get a point for an assist. If you get sent off, then we'll give you minus points. If you concede goals, we'll give you minus points. You can, is that football? Is, is that how you judge the value of a player? I don't, I don't think so. And I, I really think, speaking, and we've, we've investigated other fantasy models, um, I really don't think that's where fandom's going, um, especially with our philosophy of you know, helping you understand more about the game. There's many, many more intelligent games that we can release that I think people are ready for now. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew.